Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Rowe. And I'm Nike Fajors. And welcome to The Invisible Men, where we make the achievements of incredible men invisible no more. So let's so let's pick the one of the first areas because uh, and it relates to policing because you and it's a, it's been amazing because your work has endured in this area where you went out and tried to to take on this this narrative that black men in particular are over policed that there there's excessive force being used and you found. Well, why don't you describe the, the arc of some of the things that you found, how that mirrors or not the dominant narrative, yeah. and whether or not actually having the accurate data has changed the narrative yeah. or not. Absolutely. Love it. Let me just back up one second, which is when I go into a question like this, when it comes to police use of force or education or have you, I don't go, I go in with my personal like views normally, you know, inspired by my grandmother. But I let the data talk, and I don't care what it says. Yep. Okay? So, and I go into it thinking, this is going to help black folks every single time. So when people look at my work and they say, oh, but he didn't find what I wanted him to find, and that, that work is helping. The difference between me and, 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 and folks like that is that I'm willing to tell the truth. I don't care the, the personal cost. Let me be very clear about that. So I, I, I believe that the tr- literally the truth will set us free. And so sometimes it might be inconvenient. Like my grandmother told me the truth all the time, too. I didn't want to hear it sometimes. And sometimes it was wonderful to hear, but it was always the truth. And so I just want to be clear about that before we even get into this. That, uh, you know, my, my motivation is I am trying to make life uh, happier, better, fairer, et cetera, for black folks. And, but I am absolutely tied to the data. Okay, <laughs> I, I will not. I will not go away from it. police use of force. I think it was Walter Scott that got me. You know, I had seen um, the footage that everybody else had seen, yep. um, and I just kind of was like, "Geez, wait, wait, wait!" Just, just remind, had, just remind, just remind everyone the Walter. Yeah, Walter, Walter Scott. Scott uh, it's amazing that we have to. Okay, but, but Walter Scott uh, in South Carolina. Um, running across this patchy, seedy field is gunned down by a police officer, like shot, whatever, 10, 12 times. I don't remember the number. Um, uh, because he was pulled over for a broken taillight and just got out and ran. Okay. I, I have been roughed up by the police. Many black people I know have been rough up, roughed up by the police. I didn't know what the data were going to find, but for me, it was enough was enough. I said, we, someone has to get to the bottom of this question, right? I didn't know how, <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do, but I just knew I had to get to the bottom. And so um, went and talked to a colleague of mine. Said, I got to approach this and said, are you crazy? And I said, well, let me understand it. What you're telling me is you are more concerned about your own career than the well-being of the black folks that we could help if we actually can change police policy. And the person basically said, you betcha. <laughs> okay. Right. And and I just refuse to do that. I just don't whatever. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes when people are trying to get in the boat in they're, they're you know, they want to rock the boat until they get in it, then they're like steady now. <laughs> exactly. <Right? laughs> wow, well, that's a great okay. analogy. Okay. That and I've analogy. been dumb enough, right? Partly because of just how I was raised. I've been dumb enough to get in this boat and be like, how fast can we go? And as many of your listeners and viewers will know, I fell out the boat. I got back in the boat. <laughs> Whatever it is. Okay, we're going to move forward. So I decided to embed myself in some police departments because I said, look, I don't like the police that much. Um, and I don't even know where to find data. I don't know what the data look like. So there were some personal connections. I did some ride-alongs in Camden and in Houston wow. and other places. Okay. And, you know, uh, it was the best education I got since Miss O'Neill taught me to read in first grade. Man, this job is complicated. You know, and I'm not proud of how you feel when you're riding around in a police car. Because you feel like just the way this, the whole vibe of the, 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 
the, the job, the patrol is everyone's just on edge with your presence. You're on edge with their presence. And, and, you know, if you ride around looking for bad guys for eight hours, I'd say about hour six, even if you're a civilian, you start looking at everybody as a bad guy. It's a weird job, man. Okay. Um, uh, Houston was the same. You know, I saw a person um, die within 10 feet of me of a heroin overdose, right? On my first day on patrol in Camden. And I was done for the day. I was like, once you see, you know, breath leave someone's body, you know, maybe I'm just soft. I was like, I need a drink, man. I'm, I'm done. And I told uh, the chief of police, I said, I'm going to take the office. We're going to go have a beer. He said, what do you mean? They got to go back to work. I said, they can't get 30 minutes. And it was like, I was an alien. He said, oh, man, if I get everybody 30 minutes, everybody has someone overdose in a row house, I wouldn't have a fourth. I can't imagine. The police are honest, too. Like, this job makes me tell it's, it's a hard job. Okay. At any rate, we collected tons and tons of data. In, in Houston, we were able to collect data. And it was hard, man. We had to get innovative, right? Because they won't give it to you. So we had to go in places like Houston and set up shop and pay a sergeant $50 an hour to watch us type in the data manually. Wow. So we went to great lengths to find this data. And, and what we did was we had 10 cities with data on officer-involved shootings. We had Houston, where we had not only officer-involved shootings, we had other levels of force. We had all the taser shootings. We had a very rich data set. And then we also had two data sets, one from New York, um, that had 5 million observations on lower-level uses of force. And so we had, at the end, across all data sets, we had data that was, you know, used force as light as, you know, an argument between civilian and police all the way up to fatal shoot. Okay? And... Um, the data shocked me. I've said that before. On, I'll just give a summary, and then I'll, you, you dig in with your questions. On lower-level uses of force, we found pretty large racial differences in lower-level uses of force. Okay, So on any random stop, black people are 50% more likely to have force used on them than white people. Okay, and Now you're going to say, hey, Roland, but the stop's different. The place is different. I'm with you, brother. I got all that. Right? So, but as you increase the, the things that you can account for, when you get to the end, I can take people who got stopped on the same block at the same time of day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're still uh, 15% more likely to have four shoes on them. If I look at, this is the most striking to me, people who the police themselves say are compliant. Okay, this person didn't, they were compliant. 20% difference still in use of force by race. Okay. Now folks have come after me. How could you be so dumb to use police data, right? Listen, even the police said they were compliant. So it's, right? This is more in, your, in the favor of, of, of that argument. Even then, there was a racial difference. Okay? Now, the second piece, officer-involved shooting. Yes, there is a racial difference when you look at population proportion. In other words, black people are 50% of the fatal, uh, shootings, whether or not they're fatal and whatever 12% of the population, that's not a statistic that an economist would find interesting, but I've heard that said. Um, but when you actually start to compare apples with apples with the shootings data, you get no racial difference in shootings. Okay. I want to pause there because that's the first part people like. Right. The second part, they don't. Well, some, was, people, as, some people like it. Some people don't. I was as surprised as everyone else about the second part, but I'm going to report the data. Let me tell you, let me tell you about it. I, I gave this paper early on at a, at a law school. Three professors took me to the side. You know, this has never happened in my career. I've been doing this 20 years. I said, hey, I want you to publish that first part. And that second part is just so different, Roland. It's so different. You don't want to publish it. You, you put that away for them. I said, let me ask a question. It's just us. Let me ask a question. If the second part showed racial differences, would, would you put it in with the first part? And they said, yeah, then we put it in with the first part. I said, well, you just guaranteed I'm going to put it in no matter what. <laughs> Thank you. Right? And so... So, so Roland... That, that, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is fascinating. So, but your premise... The reason you started doing this research was that you had a belief 
And we were having all these conversations, Hannity and Combs, blah, blah, yeah. all these people talking without data. It, the central ingredient needs to be data because I believe this too. I mean, in my own work, I try to talk about data all the time in education. And yet here you are in a rigorous study and there, the initial desire is to suppress the component of your research that conflicts with the narrative, right? Yeah. Why is that desire. happening? Yeah. Why is that happening? And what can we do to change it so that that data is accepted at, for, for the data that it is, for the truth that it is? We can have, I don't know, you asked a very important question, and I don't know the answer to that, but let me just tell you what I, what, where, what I would like for me. I will literally come to your house this evening and sit up with you and argue all night about the data. But when you question my motives because you don't like the answer, I won't talk to you for two minutes. And so I think part of the issue is folks see data they don't like and they impede the motives of the person, who, of the author of the, of the study, rather than digging in and saying, <laughs> well, you don't understand selection bias, right? Like that's a different argument. Okay, I think we'd have a lot more people working in this area if the first thing you said thought was, oh, well, they're, they're an idiot economist. <laughs> they don't know how to do data. That's a different question. But when you go at someone's integrity because you don't like the findings, then of course not. Like, look, man, I mean, students are being told all across the country, don't touch these issues. Mm. Because why would you? You can study the optimal cake eating problem. Right? And, and you know, my view is... I. I I got like, you know, maybe five friends. So we got three on three and a half court. Like I'm good. So I, don't, I, don't, I don't need any more. And, and I, I, it would be so against my own identity to not keep pushing these issues. Right. Like, um, and again, it's not like I wanted this outcome. I didn't go, Ooh, wouldn't this be great to be controversial. People say you're controversial. I'm like, it's not controversial. I'm just following the data wherever it leads. What are you doing? And this has happened on both sides, right? Like sometimes I have conclusions that conservatives don't like. Sometimes I have conclusions that I, I just, I, you know, I don't care about that stuff, Ian. I really don't. I mean, I'm, I find it um, frustrating. I find it insulting that people would change the truth because they think they're trying to help us. Yeah. They're just trying to help themselves. Let's be clear. Right. Well, I know Nike. You had a you had a question. I, I have I have a Sorry. follow up question. I'll go all night on that. I'm no, 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 no. It's good. No, no, it's good. No, go ahead, Ian. Please. No, I thought you you go ahead. I'll follow behind. That's fine. Well, well the, the 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 I want to now pivot to some of the work that I you know I've, I'm familiar with a lot of your work, but also in the in the charter school world. You did some fascinating work to say, okay, there's a lot of educational failure, and it always amazes me how obsessed people are with failure and not seemingly obsessed with success, right? If there are schools that are working, is it all just random? Are they all just superheroes? Or is there anything that is common? Are there patterns of behavior? And you found that. And so can you tell us a little bit, what were the factors that you found then worked in schools. And again, it's data, but have you seen the adoption yeah. happen as a result of that data? Um, not as much as I want. Um, so what we, we went into charter schools, as you say, some good, some bad. The average charter school, the effect is zero, but there's a large tail. So you can try to learn from what the good ones are doing. And what we found was that, you know, more time was really important, right? Like my friend Jeff Canada calls it the basic physics of education. If you're behind, either you got to, you know, go faster or tell the people ahead of you, could you please slow down? He said, those, those are the two choices. Um, the second thing was how they use um, data to drive instruction. So, as you know, everyone in the world had data walls at that point. But if you, if you can't clearly articulate, once you see a piece of data, well, how do you pivot and move? For students, it wasn't effective. Third thing was uh, culture. Uh, a culture of high expectations was really, really important because everyone in our sample was dealing with, you know, high minority concentrations, 
high poverty concentrations, et cetera. But we start, we ask questions. And I have um, some people I really respect craft these questions because I didn't know how to really differentiate. Um, we, we ask questions that really got to, yes, poverty is an issue. Yes, single female head of households. And we, we understand all that. But the question is, what can I expect in terms of effort when you come in the door? And those that expected a lot had high results and those that didn't, didn't. And that's, that's a correlation, not causal, but we're going to get to the causal element of it. Okay. So that was a, that was a third. Tutoring was another. Um, and in fact, what we found that tutoring in groups of six or less for four or more days per year um, were, was, was really important. <laughs> and other things like teacher certification, um, you know, class size and things like that weren't important. Okay. Right. And so um, uh, we did this and we found this correlation and, but, you know, scientific method. I didn't want to stop there. So as, a, as you may know, we took these uh, five tenants and we turned around, tried to turn around 20 low performing schools in Houston, Texas. Okay. So we went in, we had um, 11 elementary schools, four high schools, five middle schools. And the only reason we were able to do this work was that the four high schools and the five middle schools were about to be taken over by the state. And they offered them to some of the, the, better charter networks and they're like <laughs> they say you know what you can do is shut them down and we'll and start then, them one grade level at a time and the superintendent rightly said well what am i going to do with the ninth grade already there right and in houston there was a lot of culture and tradition in these schools cashmere high school used to be an amazing jazz program in the 70s and so people in the neighborhood didn't want to shut them down okay um and i was looking for a place to really apply and to 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 be in an operator role to help understand how you turn these, these schools around. Okay. And by the way, let me just, and let me, yeah. just, let me just say, just to, I find that so courageous and important because you have a lot of people in academia who can sit back comfortably, you know, write research, write to, you know, but never get their hands dirty by actually putting their ideas into practice because it takes a lot of Rocking courage. The boat, right Rocking the boat. <laughs> Once you're in yeah, the boat, exactly. You're going. Um, so I agree with you there. So we went in and we took um, we took these schools and what we did honestly is we took them from awful to average, but that was a huge treatment effect. Okay, and so you know we closed the gap uh, in three years in the second in the middle and high schools in math. We cut it in half in reading and in elementary school in uh, four and a half years we closed both math and reading. Every single one of our Kids during the experiment, those three years in the high schools, was admitted to a two or four year college. Right. Wow. And, um, you know, it's not, if my grandma was still living, she's like, hey, hey, nothing. All he did was stick them in the, in, the, in, the, in the gym and tell them they couldn't leave until they applied. But you know what? That's what it took to make sure that, and, and you know, that wouldn't work unless they bought into the culture. And so we were really um, serious about, about this work. And we just showed, look, it's not about, these being correlates, not being causal. They were causal. And it's not about charters, cream skimming in this way and doing right. this. That's not it. It's these principles are basic principles, right? Ronald Edmonds, the ed school in the 70s, had three of the five already, right, in the successful schools movement. This is not new stuff. We took these, we put them into an experimental condition where the parents didn't choose, right? Like th there was no cream skimming here. And exactly. we were able to significantly increase achievement for black and brown kids. And so um, for me, that's one of the pieces of work I'm most proud of. And um, the lack of adoption of that particular model really was um, changed my worldview about, you know, what the outcome of this work should be. Yeah. Um, you know, people, I was, I could have done some of it in the sense of, you know, there were people saying, Oh, come do this. And, you know, uh, 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 Milwaukee or come do this in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts. But there was, we brought lots of people down to uh, Houston to see what was going on in the schools. And I was hoping they would see that and go adopt in their own places. And, you know, it just became too tough. Yep. It's hard to win a popularity contest and turn around four schools in the same year. Yep. <laughs> you can have the movie in three years when you're successful, but in that same year, it's hard. And I think, again, that's part of the room. So, so as a research practitioner, when you see, now let's get to present day, when you see ideas like, you know, 
equity start to dominate and culturally competent curriculum and you know trauma informed curriculum being no no that's what we got to do well we don't care about those five principles we got to do this other stuff like do you see that in competition with what you're saying like what yeah like how, how do you respond to when you see that because i can tell you those are not the ideas the principles that you identify are not the key they're not at the core of the education reform movement for most people leading this effort right now. Yeah, I, I understand that. I don't see them as either or. Um, curriculum is important, right? Like, um, and so there's good randomized trials on curriculum. So if you can if you can show me that the curriculum has treatment effects and we can have data-driven instruction based on whatever curriculum you have, um, I'm really good with that. And in fact, you know, I, I know the power of some of these curricula because, you know, after whatever, 16 years at Harvard, I significantly changed my course because I, I, I didn't see, um, I was teaching a course race in America and there weren't a lot of black students in it. And um, I would say before I had my kids, I just thought, well, you know, what? they can't handle the math. But after I saw how my daughters interacted with school, it really changed my view on a lot of this pedagogy. And so I, I just give you a quick example. I teach, I used to teach a course called Race in America, right? And what I would do is what typical professors do. I'd get up, I'd show a bunch of math in the, in the first couple of lectures. A hundred people will come to the first lecture and 60 come to the next. And I'd say, can't handle the hard stuff, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and the, the problem with that was that I'd have 30 black students in the first class with a hundred and in the 60, I'd have five, right? And um, I said, well, this is frustrating, right? Th this material, you know, is, is about our experience, our lived experiences. It's just done in a very, very rigorous way. How can I change it? So I kept the rigor the same. I added more reading, but I renamed the course to Profiles of Black Genius. And before we talk about... Um, uh, education reform, I have the students outside of class read about Mary McLeod Bethune. And um, we talk about her life a little bit, but then we get into the actual statistics of education reform, right? Another one of our black geniuses is Jeff Canada, right? Another one of our black geniuses is Glenn Lowry. Before we start talking about, um, you know, whether or not police stops are rational or not, we talk about statistical discrimination. I share with them some of Glenn's story. And I'm just telling you that when I did that, 100 kids came to the class and 90 stayed and 35 to 40 of them were black students. And it, 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 was a, it made the class very different. If you wrap the same rigor and materials uh, in, but have a slightly different focus. I didn't, I didn't lower my bar for anybody. We're still doing data. I'm still a data nerd. That's where we're going to go. But people understood where the, why they needed to understand and, 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 and use the math because they were trying to solve these problems. And we, and we read about a lot of other folks that they hadn't heard about in other uh, black history courses throughout the journey. Hmm. All right. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. So speaking of curriculum and, and, you know, Nike, don't let me, don't let me keep going too far here, but speaking of curriculum, you've just launched something called reconstruction yes. with our great colleague, Kaya Henderson. She's amazing. And I think, I think reconstruction can be one of the most important initiatives, not just to the black community, because it's accessible to everyone. Yeah. But talk, talk about why and, and what it is, um, why you think it's so important, and why you've decided to put your energy behind this idea. Yeah. Um, George Akalos and Rachel Grant in 2001, the um, first sentence, of this path-breaking paper on called the economics of and identity it says identity is one of the most important economic choices individuals make. It's powerful. I really believe that, right? Like um, many decisions in life, I don't have data, so I have to rely on who I am and and the principles that I believe in to be able to navigate decisions. Parenting is a great example. <laughs> wish there were more data on parenting, right? Um, and so how we teach history, who the 
heroes and the villains are and what the mindset of, of the folks are who we are studying and how, or how we're, they're presented to us really matters a lot. And one of the reasons I know that is because of my experience with this course, Black Genius, how when slightly reframed, you could turn on a, a student's curiosity in ways you couldn't imagine. It's the same as my own story. It wasn't that I wasn't smart enough to do Plato and the Republic and Socrates when I was in high school and read about and read the Odyssey. It wasn't interesting to me. Right. So if you had measured my grit at that level on the football field, it would have looked high and in, in you know, English lit, it would have looked low. OK. Yet whenever the economics was presented to me, it flipped. And so I seen that experience on my own, seen that experience with my own students. And so when Kaya and I were, were, were talking about, we, we had a, 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 a drink together and talked about how we wanted to do something really impactful for our people. What could it be? And I asked her all the things she wanted to do as chancellor of DC public schools, but couldn't. Uh, she asked me, what did, what did you wanted to do as a professor, but couldn't. And um, we stumbled on, or, or maybe not stumbled, on reconstruction because we wanted to teach kids how like we were taught as i look back ian yes uh there was um some crime in my neighborhood in daytona yes my cousins were all slinging rocks yes we didn't I, we didn't call it poverty I mean, yes we didn't we didn't have that much money but my grandmother had me convinced i could do anything anything I thought I was going to be good at something. I just didn't know what it was. Partly because I thought I was pretty good at sports, and so I just knew I was going to be good at something. And Kaya had a similar experience. Her grandmother had her believe that she could be president of the United States, right? And and my grandmother had a little trick, and and uh, I'm going to tell you, and it, but it may not be politically correct. But my grandmother, any time she saw a white person make a mistake, it could be using T-H, T-H-E-I-R instead of E-R-E, or it could have been tripping off of a curb, or it could have been miscounting her change. She would look at me directly in the eye, and she would roll her eyes and go, that's that inferior, that's that superior race. <laughs> I grew up feeling like Black people were so much smarter, so much faster, so much more resilient, right? Like, I did not grow up with any thoughts of any inferiority anywhere, any gap mindset, nothing. And as I grow up, I realized how brilliant that was. And I'm so grateful to her because, again, I, yes, there was discrimination, palpable. Yes, there was there were roadblocks, palpable. Yes, you couldn't go in someone else's living room. But for me, I was like, fine, there's other living rooms I can go to. Like, hey, this is, yes, there's, you know, there's going to be discrimination. Is there discrimination in the world? Of course. Is, is the derivative on effort still extremely high? Absolutely. Right? That's what, that's what I tell my kids. It doesn't matter. Put in effort and you'll, you'll, you'll get there. Okay? And so that's how... That's why, one of the reasons, sorry I got off there, but that's one of the, my big passions behind Reconstruction because I want every kid to feel that special. I want every kid to know that, you know, you start off in school, and I remember, like, I used to hate February, right? You know, sitting in this integrated <laughs> elementary school, and every word I could read, they're like, good, that's a good yeah. job, right? And it just, like, drove me nuts. Like, you know, I remember those, when I, what's a harvest moon? I was like, oh, well, that's what they can pick the cotton at night too and they're like that's a good job i was like stop it <laughs> right and so um i want every kid who goes through reconstruction to feel as empowered as my grandmother made me feel to feel that that just more effort and they can get there right i used to ask my grandfather only had a second grade education he used to work on a celery farm but he figured out a way to go to a community college and get a little, uh, get an associate's degree and, and learn to be the only black guy doing refrigeration and air conditioning really early in Daytona Beach, Florida. And you know what? Bought himself a nice house on a corner lot in the hood. I asked him one day, granddaddy, why you get up at, at five? And he said, because the white man gets up at six. Right? It was just like, for him, it was just, and so I just always thought, 
uh, effort would get me there. And I know their examples. I, I get all that. Like I'm, I, I, I'm true to the data. I understand this doesn't always, um, not always the case. But if you look at the fullness of the data, uh, it, it's hard not to fundamentally believe that um, that we can do anything. And I really, and, I, and that's what I want the kids at Reconstruction to understand. I don't want them to be taught that it's slavery, Jim Crow, than you, right? No, that's not the way it works. And okay. so I want them to be enriched. I want them to solve problems that they find interesting. Like in our linear al- algebra classes where they're doing dynamic optimization, they're trying to figure out, well, if I've got this many theaters and preferences look like this, how do I distribute the Black Panther movie in a way that maximizes revenue? I want to think about questions like that, right? Or, or I want them doing spoken word where they're um, listening to uh, doing poetry or other things like that that they find interesting. Um, and so I could get all fired up about that, but I want them to see themselves in the history. I want them to, the, for the history to be full and for them to be empowered and understand that there's absolutely nothing they can do and that they're very special. Yeah, Roland, uh, a person comes to mind as I, I listen and learn from you and feel your energy and see your accomplishments. And that person is Picasso. You know, when I look at you, I hope you live to a hundred like Picasso did because your your output is Picasso-like. Your ability to produce, his was art. Yours is information, knowledge, and information. It, it's really exceptional. And uh, I hope you have at least three more lifetimes uh, in terms of what you have left, because it'll benefit all of us uh, massively. That's, that's extremely, I've, I've never heard anything like that. It's extremely nice of you. But, and I just tell you, brother, I'm taking care of myself. And all, all of this, I'm, trying to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to take care of myself. But yeah, I, I, just want, I, I, I just want to get, I think the truth, truth helps us, right? False narratives do not. The truth is enough to get us all enough. we need. The truth is enough. Yeah, I mean, just closing remarks, brother. Uh, you know, it, it's one of the true pleasures of my life is to meet men who represented and represent what I wished I had accomplished in my life. I'm, I'm 10 years older than you, and I'm not done yet. I got a few more years, but it's such a privilege to meet a young man, I'll call you that, who represents when I thought about my best version of myself, which I didn't achieve, and you've achieved those things. And the energy and the velocity of your life is so exceptional. I just, I want to make it clear how proud I am of you. And, uh, you know, you'll continue to get our support in, in, in any way possible. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching another episode of The Invisible Men. You can find other episodes at the AEI podcast channel on YouTube or the website invisible.men or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.